Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nikhil Barthwell, and I'm going to be talking about implementing event-driven microservices today. So the agenda I have is I'll start with the motivation of why we would want to move from monolithic to microservice. I'll go on with understanding the problem of distributed data in microservices, use domain-driven design to partition the data. And finally, the motivation of why we want to do event-driven microservices. And continuing around that, what are the patterns, architectural patterns like event sourcing, CQRS? And finally, ending up with how you would solve the distributed data problem using sagas. And of course, towards the end, I have some reference for further reading. So I'll start with the good old approach, right? Monolithic, the easy to test, easy to deploy, et cetera. This is how most of the systems start. And the problem with this approach is that it doesn't scale, right? It works in the beginning when the code base is small, but as the code base becomes you know, bigger and bigger, it becomes what in sometimes we call as big ball of mud. It's slower to develop, hard to test, hard to you know, deploy because it's big. <clears throat> and there's a lot of team inter interdependency here because everybody is working on the same code base. So there's, there's really not much of a boundary or a partition. So if I have to make a change, or Team X have to make a change, they would have to coordinate with Team Y, Team Z, because once you deploy, it's one unit everybody has to deploy together. So obviously, monolithic is not the best way, or not the most agile way of doing things. And so, we move to microservices, right? The brave new world, although it's not so new anymore. But with microservice, you have what is called as a single responsibility principle. Right, smaller code base to understand and change. It makes the team autonomous, and we'll see why the teams get autonomous with microservices. And it's faster to test and deploy. So basically what microservices is, is it's an assembly of loosely coupled services. And what do we mean by the term loosely coupled service? Well, what the, what the term actually means is when, when we define coupling between two services, it means one service doesn't have to know a lot of details about the other service. They have a common interface or contract, as we call it. And as long as the service guarantees a certain contract, I don't really need to know the implementation of that. Um, although the term microservices really emerged, I would say more like early 2010, 15, somewhere around that period, when you think about it, the concept isn't new. Um, in fact, I would go about saying that microservices is an application of object-oriented programming to web service. Why? When you look at object-oriented programming, like right, what, what is object-oriented programming? The concept of object-oriented programming is that you have a class, and you have an interface to that class, right? the public interface. And then you have the private methods, and you have the private attributes. The private attributes is an internal state of the class, right? And the external, external entity sees that interface, and it has to manipulate that internal state via the public methods. And when you look at microservices, it's the exact same thing. Microservices have a database attached. We'll see, um, we'll cover more details on that. And you don't have access to that internal state or the database. Um, so you have to have the public API to basically query or change anything in that database or in the state. Ironically, object-oriented programming historically uh, was basically an object or application of biology into computer science. So one of the early pioneers of object-oriented programming, Alan Kay, was trained as a biologist. And when he was given the task, he was working for US Department of Defense, Air Force, or I think some of that. And he was given the task of designing and maintaining some software. And what he see was software is like a living organism. And a living organism consists of cells, like biological cells. And cells have cell wall, which is the interface. And everything inside the cell is like private to the cell. So he says, well, let's take that concept of biology and apply it to object-oriented pro or computer programming. And we called it object-oriented programming, where the object or the class is the cell. And the public interface is basically the wall. And then we took the same concept and we rebranded it and we call it microservice and it becomes a new concept, but it isn't really a new concept um, in strict sense. So what we have in a microservice is we have loose coupling. 
typically what you have is each database, each service has one database. Now, when I say one database, it doesn't have to be a physically separate database. It could be a logically partitioned one. Nevertheless, it has one database. That is to say that the schema is private to only one service. You, you don't share schema across two services. And what that means is that as long as I keep the public interface of the service chain, I can internally change that schema any way I want. The other entity, or the consumer of that service, doesn't have to be aware of it. He doesn't get affected, as long as there's no contract change. There are times when you have to change the contract, and that's a whole different story. Contracts can be versioned, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, that's rare. In most of the cases, you keep the contract, especially if you design, architect the system well, you keep the contract more or less the same. It evolves in a very slow pace. And each service can itself evolve fast. And so what happens with this loosely coupled service is that the teams that are working on the service, they kind of become independent of each other. Because as long as the contract stays the same, Team X can make any changes to the code and deploy. They don't have to deploy the entire service. They don't have to even coordinate with the Team Y. Team Y may not even know about it. As a result, a loosely coupled service, what it does is it reduces team interdependency. And when you have reduced team interdependency, you can innovate faster. And this is the reason why microservices usually will let you enable, increase your engineering velocity. And that's one of the very positive things about microservices. In fact, one of the early motivations of why we want to move to microservices. So the question is, we know that we have the system and we know you know, we have to partition it, and we have to partition it in a way that the interface makes sense. It has to be well designed, and interface should not change too often. The question is, how do you practically do it? And one of the common, uh, very common design methodologies that is used in this case is domain-driven design. Now, domain-driven design by itself um, is a big topic, and I obviously cannot go into too much of details. In fact, you could have an entire conference dedicated to domain-driven design. So very briefly, domain-driven design, this is the textbook definition that it basically models your, your actual physical stuff into, into these things called entities value objects. So it's, a, it's an approach for software development for complex needs by connecting implementation to a model. Right? You have a model that evolves. And the component of these models are basically denoted by a lot of these things like entity, value objects, and bounded context. And it's kind of a layered system where you have the user interface, which is typically not, not really there in a back-end service, but in sometimes in some kind of desktop software, you would have it. And then you have an application layer. And then you have a domain layer, which is basically where the bulk of your code would reside. And then you have a very thin infrastructure of persistence. And this is a layered approach. This is actually a simple model of domain-driven design. If you read the textbook, they will have more complex models, like hexagonal models, where they actually um, take into account how would you test these services. And then there is an onion architecture also, which is around the same thing. It just looks like an onion with layers on top of it. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll say I'll just refer to the simple model. And bulk of the code remains in this domain layers, and you can do something to these objects. And these are all the various building blocks of uh, domain-driven design. I have a reference for domain-driven design towards the end. But the one that I'm actually going to talk about more, and which is of very, very much of a use to create service boundaries, is actually the last one, aggregates. So what are aggregates? Well, aggregates are essentially a collection of domain objects. And they're, they're logically a single entity with some kind of component that you call as root that you can refer to. And every reference of this collection of objects can just be referred by a root. Now, what are the examples of an aggregate? Let's say you're designing an e-commerce system, right? So when you talk about an e-commerce system, say anything like an Amazon.com, Jet.com, or a whole bunch of stuff, you place an order, and I want to buy items A, B, C in quantities X, Y, Z. That's my order, right? This order is one entity which consists of various smaller entities like products and possibly services and so on. But I can refer to this order as one entity. And this order has a unique ID, my order ID internally in the system. So that's an example of an aggregate. And then what you can thought about, what you can think about is, 
your actual physical domain model is basically a collection of aggregates. So why are aggregates so important in designing microservices? The reason is aggregates basically give you a boundary or a way for partitioning your system. So essentially, what you could do is when you're designing your system, you build a model of it, you identify the aggregates, and then each aggregate can basically be implemented as one service. So you now have a natural way of basically decomposing your system into a set of services. And a good thing about aggregate is it's like, I mean, there's no, first of all, I should say that there is no unique way of partitioning your system because, in, let's say in this example, I could say order service, consumer service, product service, but I can actually merge product service and consumer service into one also and have order service separate. So there is no unique way of partitioning the system, but the general recommended practice is to partition it as finely grained as possible. Although there is a possibility that you might over-engineer if you go into too much of details, but generally an aggregate would be a good natural boundary where you can partition the system and keep the aggregates as small as possible. <laughs> and what that means is that you have a unique like a set of public methods, I would call it, or an API for dealing with aggregate, and this is your public contract. Whatever happens, however you want to represent your order internally is immaterial. This contract is unlikely to change over a period of time. It would, but it won't be too fast. And when you have, you, you have to coordinate with the teams, and that's the case where there's a little bit of team dependency and so on, but that's usually rare. So that's not something that happens too often, so it doesn't affect your engineering velocity. So this is the significance of domain-driven design. Domain-driven design gives you a way to partition your system in a manner that makes sense physically and that gives you a way in which you can arrive at these contracts, arrive at this partitioning in a way that would not, that internal stuff might evolve in any way, but the public contract is likely to stay constant over a period of time. So now that we have talked about distributed data, we know that each microservice has you know, each microservice has its own private database. What are the problems with distributed data, right? In fact, when you move to microservices, data is going to be your biggest problem. That's where people face the maximum challenge on what do you do with distributed data. And distributed data, you now have a problem of keeping the data consistent because data resides in a lot of states. And you also, if you want to query, how do you query? Because if you have a monolithic system with one big database, I can pick a query to that database and I have all the information. But now, in order to query, and I'll see an example, in order to query, we have to basically query different services. So let's actually take this um, SQL service as an example. And typical databases, they follow the asset model, right? I can have, uh, I can make a SQL query, I can just get all the stuff. And here, the problem is that when you run this SQL query, it actually spans two services. Because customer service is a separate, which has the customer data, and product service is separate, which has a product data. So you can't really run a SQL query like that. There are ways of handling it using two-phase commits, but two-phase commits aren't really a, a very practical way. I mean, there are a bunch of problems like like I mentioned, coordinator is a single point of failure. It's very chatty, locks, and so on. It's not really a scalable one. And the last but not the least, it does impact availability. And availability is one of the most critical things of your system. In fact, I'll talk about the CAP theorem, but when you look at the CAP theorem, availability and network partition tolerance is basically the two factors that you keep. And consistency is what you kind of sacrifice. And the reason is availability translates to revenue. If your site is down for one minute, depending on the size of your business, you could end up losing millions of dollars. So availability is something that you almost always never want to sacrifice. So now, you can't use two-phase commits. How do you deal with this problem? Now, before I go into the solution, I'm going to introduce the eventual consistency model. Like I said, generally, you have consistency available and uh, availability and network partition. And we know that we can't have all three of them. 
So availability, we can't make a compromise on. A distributed system by nature is distributed, so you have network partition. But what you can basically compromise to a limited extent is consistency. So we move to, from consistency to what is eventual consistency. And what eventual consistency basically means that if I have a system and I do some transaction, it may not be consistent after the completion of the transfer immediately, but eventually it will reach the state of consistency. Now, eventually in practical sense means couple of microseconds, milliseconds, etc. So eventually it doesn't mean that, okay, fine, after five days your system would be consistent. No, no, no. It's going to happen pretty soon. And generally that is not a problem. Because, for example, again, I go to an e-commerce site, I place an order today, I'm in Germany, my home is in US. What's the likelihood of me placing another order in US within the next five minutes, right? I actually have to physically go there. So let's say my data here in the German data center changes. It's going to be consistent with the US data center within seconds. And it's very, very unlikely that somebody who's going to place another order from my account in US, unless my account is hacked, in which case I have a bigger problem to worry about than consistency itself. So, event-driven microservice architecture basically provides you a way to design system where you have availability and partition tolerance, but sacrificing consistency to eventual consistency. Now, a lot of people, they use microservice architecture and event-driven microservice architecture basically synonymously. They are not the same. Event-driven microservice architecture is a subset of microservice architecture. All microservice architecture is doing is basically a system which is assembly of loose components, that's all. It doesn't talk about any characteristics of it, of how, what happens to consistency, what happens to availability. Event-driven microservices is a unique architecture within that system where you communicate with events using a message bus and there are other ways of doing it. Of course, you have other ways of solving the same problem, but Event-driven microservices is a subset of microservice architecture. The thing is, it's so popular that whenever you talk about microservice architecture, people just assume that you're using event-driven microservice architecture. So it kind of, in the literature, you know, you might just see those two interchangeably used. So let's talk about event-driven microservice architecture. What is an event-driven microservice architecture? I kind of talked about it, that you have these services and you have these services that communicate using events, right? So events occur in this manner change systems and then the listeners are notified. And by definition, it's a very highly distributed, loosely coupled architecture. Highly distributed and loosely coupled in the sense that the senders and receivers, they are not really aware of each other. And often it has an asynchronous uh, flow of information. Again, fancy terms aside, when you look at event-driven architecture in real life, we have been using it for centuries. You go to an airport, somebody makes an announcement. That's an event-driven architecture. Oh, your flight is leaving in 10 minutes. An event is going to happen. The sender broadcasts it. Sender does not know who the listeners are, right? They'll just broadcast it over the microservices. They have no a microphone. They have no synchronous acknowledgement that the listeners or basically the passengers at the airport have heard it or ignored it. The passengers who are interested in that flight would basically react, others would ignore. So it's kind of asynchronous, sender doesn't know anything about the listener, and listeners can come and go, and sender doesn't really have to be concerned about that. So that's a very common um, example of event-driven architectures. Of course, in more in computer science and web services, you would have event-driven architectures. You have message bus like Kafka, you put in events, there are listeners, producers, consumers, sensors. These are practical implementations of event-driven architecture. Now, most of the services, they, they basically use different forms. So there are two communication patterns here. One communication pattern, you can think of it as request response, like this. You know, service A calls service B directly. And this is more of a synchronous response. And then you have an asynchronous service A sends a message event to service B through a broker, which is an asynchronous in the sense that service A and service B, they're not aware of each other. The broker is the one that is basically establishing that communication line. Now, most of the real life systems, these basically are a combination of event-driven and direct request response. 
it's very rare, I wouldn't, depending on the application, there are some rare exceptions where you, know, you have either one of them, but real world is almost always hybrid. And sometimes we use direct communication, and sometimes we use indirect, event-driven. Um, direct has its own advantage, right? It's easy to implement, and it has a really good error control. Because let's say that a service in this example, or a service calls a product service, and product service is down or cannot act on that, it will immediately send you back a response. So I know something happened, or the service knows something bad happened. Whereas in a message broker, or a service just sends an event, and then it has no idea what happened to that event. I mean, the product service might pick up that event, hopefully. If it doesn't for any reason, you know, the service doesn't really know. So as a result, you have a very high visibility. If something goes wrong, you can actually take precautionary actions. The problem with direct messaging is that you now have increased coupling, right? If order service has to contact these individual services, it basically has to know which service I need to talk to. Right? It's product service also have to be aware of the fact that order service would contact me. And we know that coupling is not a good idea because of all the reasons that you have in monolithic that increases the team dependency, slows down the innovation, and so on. And also, it's a difficult thing to scale. Well, in this example, I just have, what, six services, so it's easy. But imagine when you have, I don't know, 1,000 to Uber, an engineer from Uber told me that they operate 7,000 microservices. The startup I worked for operate 1,000 services, and everybody uses direct messaging then. And if you try to draw a diagram on a piece of paper or a screen, you could imagine how complicated that direct diagram would be. You have no idea what is happening. And then you introduce one more node in that graph, and you will blow your mind because it gets so confusing. So that's the problem with direct messaging. It's difficult to scale. Communication via message broker would avoid that problem, right? It's much more scalable. I can, if I want to order, create a service and expand and put new business functionality, I can plug in one service, I can remove that service. Now the services aren't, don't even need to know about each other, so there's a decreased amount of coupling. Um, of course, the drawback is that now you have a message broker, which is a highly available component. If that fails, good luck to you. Uh, your system is going to go down. Also, you know, you don't have as good of uh, traceability, uh, like error control, right? We saw in the direct message, error control is really good. Here again, a message is sent, you don't know what happened. So that gives rise to traceability, and then there are ways in which you can uh, distributed tracing um, software, what is it called? Distributed tracing, Zipkin, and Uber has some Jaeger, and you employ all those to build what's actually happening to give you visibility, but you have a loss of visibility in the system. And like I mentioned, in real life microservices architecture, you kind of use both. And you can divide your, I mean, in this example, I've divided my services in three tiers, but honestly, you can divide it in n number of tiers you want. And you have certain services that are directly customer facing. For example, let's say an example of an e-commerce site like Amazon or Jet. If that service goes down, you can't place your order. The customer knows it, it right away affects him, and obviously loss of revenue. You want to use request response in those kind of systems, because it has better error control. Obviously, that's the, there's only a small part of the services that are user facing, right? If you have like 10,000 services running, you probably user is interacting with four or 500. They're not going to be interacting with all of them directly. So that particular layer is usually implemented with using request response, a more synchronous way. And the rest of it is event driven. Tier 2 would be an example product service, right? If that service is down, your product is going to get delayed by a couple of hours, maybe. But it's not going to impact in the sense the site isn't unusable. It might just get delayed by a few hours. And then you have a Tier 3 where you have little to no impact for customers, for example, some kind of monitoring, logging. I mean, if you are going to place an order, who cares what logging system the company is using? It doesn't bother you at all. So those kinds of services are usually implemented using event-driven model. Now I'm going to introduce event sourcing. Um, what is event sourcing? Event sourcing is an architectural pattern that you use in event-driven architecture. 
where you model your system as a sequence of events. So every time the state of the system changes, you have an event that is generated, and basically storing that event that could trigger that state change. So instead of having a state of the system, you have these events that didn't pass through your broker. And this has a very um, interesting property that you can actually play back a sequence of events or roll back in particular time. Again, looks like a fancy term, but directly or indirectly, you have been using event sourcing for centuries. For example, a version control is an event sourcing system. Bank ledger is an event sourcing system. When you start a new repository, let's say Git, you have an empty state. And then you make series of commit. And each of this commit is an event. Your state of the system is basically your source code. And as you make those series of commits, you can actually build up the state of the system by series. You can do a git log, and you can actually see each one of these commits. And then you can roll back in time, and you can see, oh, three days ago, that's how my source code looks like. And the really interesting thing that you can do with this is because each transaction is stored separately as opposed to the complete state, you can undo a certain transaction. In the sense, I have 2,000 commits, I can go back, I can undo a commit, and then play back the rest of the system, and then my system, there could be conflicts, though, in that, this particular case, but at least you have some ability to do that. The same thing with bank ledger, right? You have, you open up an account in your bank, you have basically an account with zero dollars or zero euros. And then you make series of commits, you deposit, you withdraw, and as the ledger grows, each one of these transactions is recorded. And basically, the state of the system, in this example, the balance in your account is basically a sum total of all the transactions, how many credits you did as opposed to how many debits. And the same thing, like in credit card, all too many times you happen, right? I, time and again, it has happened. My credit card got stolen. Somebody used it or somebody got my number, so I had to call up the bank, hey, this is a fraud charge, they rewind it back, undo that charge, and then play it back, and guess what? Everything works perfect. So that's event sourcing. The problem with event sourcing is that each time, you don't really have your state stored, right? So each time I want the state of, let's say, you are going to go to the bank, and I need to know how much money I have in my account, and I've been operating in this account for like 20 years. So are you telling me that to make that query, I have to replay 20 years worth of all the transactions to get the amount? Obviously, that's too inefficient. So the way bank would do it is it takes the snapshot. Let's say it would take a snapshot account balance at the end of the day. So if I go in the middle of the day, and I say, OK, I make a query, how much money do I have in my account? It takes the last snapshot, and then it replays the event that happens in a day, and it gives me the current state of the system. So snapshotting is an alternative to playing events which really uh, mitigates the drawback where you have to build the state of the system using sequence of events. So another advantage of event sourcing is that you have these events, right? Imagine that there are these events passed to the message brokers and then there are different consumers consuming that event. You can consume certain events. Each service has a choice of what to ignore and what not. A good example of it is a social network. Right? In social network, you basically have your profile view, you have your photographs, you have your timeline. Everything, something happens, gets posted to your timeline. Let's say you got married, it gets posted to your timeline, but the photo app ignores it. And then you put a new photo, it updates the photo app, the timeline still put it, so the person information section ignores it. So you have the same sequence of events, and different services are creating multiple views from that. So event sourcing has its own benefits and drawbacks. It's very popular, 100% um, accurate logging. You can do time-wise. You can switch back in time. Application can process the same events. But obviously, it adds more complexity. and there is no strict consistency because event is generated, all the service will pick up that event and then you know, build up the state. But then we are talking about eventual systems. So this is something that's going to happen in eventual system anyway. And then you can have longer boot up times. Those snapshots can fix that problem. A related pattern to event sourcing is CQRS, or Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It's kind of a must for event sourcing. Why is it must? Because, again, if I want to query the state, I'm going to build up the state and then query it. So how it happens is that you separate your queries into a command, 
and query. And a command is something which doesn't give you an answer. I just issue a command. And then your query does, doesn't have a side effect. So you have your common event store or whatever you're using to store that event. So maybe just your message broker. I mean, Kafka can act as a message. Uh, Kafka can act as your event sourcing itself. But generally, people use a dedicated system like event source or something similar. So these different services, they are continuously building a state of the system. So I can put a query and I can read the state of the system as new events happen. The different service, the, read, the second service will pick up this event and update the state. Of course, there's a lag between that. And again, it ties back to my point <coughs> that we are talking about eventually consistent systems. So if an update happens, the chances that the read service would immediately update the state is not going to happen. Anyway, so moving on from CQRS, we talk about the benefits and drawbacks. Well, honestly, if you're using event sourcing, you really don't have much choice. But it improves the separation of concerns, right? Read and write, and you can have multiple views of the same system, scalable, denominized views. Of course, like everything, there could be code duplication, there's a replication lag, there's no strict consistency, and above everything else, every pattern you use adds complexity. So that's CQRS. Now let's get back <coughs> to the problem of the original problem that we have, <coughs> which is by far the biggest problem you're going to face when you move to microservices, or more specifically to event-driven microservice, is distributed data, consistency of distributed data. How do you solve that? We know that we can't do asset transactions. We know we can't do two-phase commits. So the answer lies in something called sagas. The concept of sagas is actually not really that new. Um, sagas have been based on 1987 paper. This was the original paper. But that was originally designed for a single database running a single node. So there are adaptations of Saga to do with distributed systems because they have asynchronous nature, and above everything else, they have partial failure. So there are different variations of Sagas also. I'm not going to go in and talk about too much of these variations, but let's introduce basically what is a Saga. Well, in a way, and I should probably have this slide first, Saga is essentially a long-running transaction which has compensating actions to handle failure. For example, you have a transaction, uh, and I'll give an example. You have a transaction T1, T2, T3, and these are your sequence of actions. So each action, basically, a service would do some transaction and then put an event on the message bus. OK, I've completed this. The second service picks up that event, does something, puts another event, and so on and so on. And let's say a service fails, because you could have a failure at any one point of time. The service would send an event back saying, I failed. The original service they can pick up, and then they can have undo the event that I did. So that is how you, you basically kind of guarantee atomicity, right? So if I fail somewhere in the middle, I would basically unroll all the changes I have. So at the end, either I pass completely or I fail completely. But I would not be in a state of partial success. So here you can see a transaction T1 moves to T2, T2 failed, so it was supposed to go to T3, but it won't. It actually will call back the R1, which is the rollback transaction. You could get into a pretty interesting scenarios with that. Again, there are a lot of branching. I mean, this is a simple example. You can deal into a branching scenario. So let's actually take an example here. I go, um, I give someone a check, right? So I have an account, you have an account. We both have an account. I have some money, hopefully, and I give you a check. What happens? Well, the first step is when I issue a check and you go to the bank, the bank would look at that check and say, OK, fine, I have issued you $1,000. It first tries to deduct $1,000 from my account. Right? It will remove $1,000, then it tries to deposit into your account. Now, when it does the first action, maybe I don't have $1,000. I only have $800. So it would basically nullify. The saga is incomplete. You know, This action cannot happen. But let's say I do have $1,000, so it removes $1,000, and now it's about to put it in your account. For some reason, you decide to close your account. Okay? So the money is off my account, but it doesn't go anywhere. So when the second service picks up that action, let's say T2, and it tries to deposit, it says this account doesn't exist, so it will start a rollback. What is a rollback? Well, the rollback is that original $1,000 that was deducted from my account 
will now be put back in my account. So I would see my drop balance drop by $1,000, then next day it will come back by $1,000. So that there's a compensating action to that. Um, I don't know why the slide went off. Okay, it's happening there. Okay, good. So anyway, now you could get into interesting scenario because let's say in this particular example, you close your account, the money was supposed to come back to my account, then I also close my account. So you have this money hanging around, we don't know what happened. So again, in real life, when you draw these chains of actions and compensating actions, obviously this is not one linear, but it can get into branching and you can get into a whole lot of interesting scenarios on what happens if this fails, this fails, this fails, what do you do? And in some cases, you have no idea what you have to do. Okay, but sagas have a problem, and the problem sagas have, it does not have isolation, right? So we know the good old databases have asset. Properties, atomicity, it has an atomicity, all transactions are executed. I know if something fails, I can roll back and I can get into a state where either I pass completely or I don't pass. Consistency, of course it is consistency, not strict consistency, it's an eventual consistency, but it's still a consistency. I know that eventually my system would move from one valid state to another valid state. Right? There's a durability because message brokers are guaranteeing it, database is guaranteeing it, but there is no isolation, right? For example, again, um, let's say you place an order on some e-commerce website and the saga that gets started. Okay, place an order, let's process this order, and then it passes to the second option. Let's ship that order, right? So the saga hasn't really yet completed, where you make a second action and say cancel that order. So you, now you're in the middle of a state of processing the saga, you know, there are some, in the product inventory, something is deducted, it's going to pass to ship, and now you suddenly say, another basically action happens, cancel it, which is a different saga, it's not the same saga, right? And now you're in a situation of dirty reads and all sorts of complications because the compensating action cannot happen because it took that action, but something else happened to the state of the system and when it tries to roll back, it may not be able to roll back because state of the original system changed. So lack of isolations can get into a problem of how you implement um, sagas. Um, there is no clear-cut way of really, I mean, there's no straightforward way of solving this problem, but a good designed system with well-defined boundaries. Um, obviously, you first would be in a state where such a thing is less likely to happen. And if it does happen, you can basically have event sourcing, so you can always have more uh, mechanisms like, okay, let me look at the past event before I cancel this event. Like This is an event where, okay, a previous order happened, and this is in the middle, it hasn't really completed. So let me wait for that shipping service to first inform, stop, don't ship that, and then I'm gonna do a compensating action. So all this logic can be implemented, but it has to be implemented, right? And that's what makes it more complicated, like your, your system would get more complicated. So that's, I mean, microservices, this is the reason why they say that when you're dealing with data, your data is gonna be your biggest pain point. It's not really going to be the stateless part of the system. So now, Saga don't have isolation, but the question is, how do we sequence these transactions? I mean, you talked about Saga, I know that I have to do step A, B, C, who decides these steps, who executes these steps. There are two basic ways of how you would actually solve this problem. Uh, one is called choreography, which is more like a dis distributed decision making. You don't really have a central entity um, that's gonna make a decision. It's the decision making is distributed, which frankly speaking is a horrible idea. And then you have orchestration, uh, which is more like a centralized decision making. And choreography is very simple to implement. So that's one of the pros of choreography because you already have a message broker, right? So as you are doing actions, you can always put the messages on your message broker. The message broker picks, it knows what's happening. It has all the logic implemented in the services. So it knows what decisions to make. So that's the benefit of choreography. It's simple to implement. Participants are kind of also loosely coupled, but the problem is that 
you could have a cyclic dependency because service A sends an event to service B, service B sends an event which service has to pay and you could get into a situation of infinite loops. You also have to increase some amount of coupling between the components because like I said, the shipping saga now has to know about the cancelling order one because it can happen that you can cancel a service before it's, uh, cancel an order before it's shipped. So that increases the coupling and again, coup increase in coupling reduces your engineering velocity. So choreography kind of has this drawback and that's why generally choreography is not very much used. What you use is orchestration. And in orchestration, you basically create an object, an orchestrator that stays in that, that has all the logic. And it's actually, um, from an implementation point of view, it's kind of a little tricky to implement, but it's much easy to understand because you're, you know, Saga is kind of a state machine, so you have this object separate where all the logic of your state machine decides, as opposed to distributed in your, I don't know, thousands of services. So it's much easier to reason, understand, if something goes wrong, you can fix and so on. So that's why, that's a big benefit of orchestration. Also, the individual components don't really have to know each other, so it, it keeps the benefit of uh, very low coupling between the components. And there aren't that many significant drawbacks. I mean, sure, it's a little tricky to implement, but it's not something too bad because you have an object that handles all the state machine. So sure, you might have one or two more classes in your code, but that's about it. And, um, and sometimes you can argue that, you know, there are these dumb services being contacted by smart orchestrators, but again, what difference does it make? So there aren't that many significant uh, drawbacks to orchestration, and that is why uh, orchestration is basically used a lot in practice. And towards the end, I'll wrap up by giving some resources uh, building microservices written by Sam Newman. I met him last year actually in Oslo. And he told me that, so this is the book he published in 2015. He's writing another book, basically a uh, second version of this book. I don't know when he plans to publish it, but this is actually pretty good, um, a good book. A domain-driven design, it was written in 2002 or three by Eric Evans. It's considered to be the masterpiece in domain-driven design, it's referred to as the blue book. So if you talk about domain-driven design, this is the book, except it's a thick book, 500 pages. So it's a little bit of read. There are other books like Implementing Domain-Driven Design and Domain-Driven Design Distilled by uh, Vince Bock, which is actually more thin book. So if you don't have time to read 500 pages, you can just read that one, and that kind of gives you all the basic ideas you need to know without going into de too much of details. And then you basically have microservices patterns by Chris uh, Richards, and this is an excellent book. It talks about um, all the architecture patterns, basically, that I'll talk about, and many, many more. And there are some of the slides and presentations, like Eric Even, the author of the second book, uh, the InfoQ article, DDD Microservices, he talks about how to use domain-driven design to uh, break the system and create service boundaries. You have the overview of sagas, and there's another um, link here of distributed saga. So distributed sagas is basically a more, I wouldn't exactly use the word complicated, but a variant of the original simple saga that actually is used by Twitter. So that's a talk by Katie. She talks about distributed saga and how they implement. Um, to summarize, I know I've given a lot of information in a rather <laughs> short time frame. To summarize, I'll talk about uh, microservices enable faster innovations. We have a problem of how to create the service boundaries, so domain-driven design helps us. Um, the data in microservices is distributed because by nature services are loosely coupled, but um, that, that kind of creates a challenge. We talked about event-driven architecture that we can use for eventual consistency. That way we can implement a distributed system with high availability without, sac uh, without um, sacrificing too much of consistency. Uh, we looked at event sourcing and CQRS patterns that you need for event-driven architecture. And finally, we looked at sagas, at least an overview. Sagas itself is a big topic, of course. Um, sagas of how you would maintain data consistency across services. With this, I would like to thank you guys for listening. And I have about...
10, 15 minutes, 15 minutes actually left. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Any, yes, sir. Uh, what do I think is the best message broker? I don't actually believe that there is anything called best because the standard answer to all such questions is it depends. So, so I'll say that definitely Kafka is by far the most popular message broker. I haven't used a Rabbit MQ uh, too much, so I don't really know. Again, if if you are trying to or if you want to stay vendor neutral, or you want a multi-cloud, you might go with Kafka. But generally, every every cloud platform has its own message broker. Google has PubSub. I think Amazon, I'm not too familiar with AWS because obviously I'm more familiar with GCP side, but AWS has, I think, SQS or something like that, simple queuing service. And Azure has service bus. So if you're going to stay within your cloud vendor, you don't plan to go out, you could use the message broker that they provide that eases your task. Of course, now you have a little bit of vendor dependency introduced. Um, I think. Um, Amazon recently, not recently, um, maybe a year back, launched Kafka as a service because I read in the news that there was some um, some legal issues with it. The company Confluent that basically had the originals of Kafka. They basically Amazon kind of Kafka as a service basically now competes with Confluent, and Confluent people didn't like it, so there was some legal and licensing issues. But Amazon does have something like a Kafka in the service. I don't know to what extent. It's provided, it may not provide all the bells and whistles of Kafka because of copyright and legal reasons, but that also gives you an advantage that you can kind of write a code that you can move from one cloud vendor to another, or especially when you have, um, when you have something like, you know, you have a hybrid system where you are doing something on-prem and on something cloud. Um, you know, you, could, you have a way of running this message broker which is kind of vendor neutral. So that's one use case scenario that you have. Also, you don't really have to use one message broker. And there are scenarios where you have more than one. I was consulting with a sports and goods company, and what they have there is, they have one side of the ID that's on Microsoft Azure, because you know they are a Microsoft share, they have SharePoint and everything, so they want to stick with the Microsoft side of things. And then they also were doing something machine learning, so other, other engineering group was using Google because they have the best machine learning stuff there. And the problem is now you have data in two different clouds, and obviously it's not replicated. How do you communicate? So they had this problem, and the way they solved it was they connected the service bus. So they had a service with cloud sub that every time an event comes, it basically calls the Azure side, Azure service bus, right, to pass the same event, and vice versa. So now you have two different message brokers in the same system acting. And that way, you can use both Amazon, um, Azure and Cloud. So again, GCP. So again, it kind of depends on your scenario, which what makes best sense for you. <clears throat> that answers your question. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, can you speak a little loudly? Yeah. Um, so the question is, what technology options do I recommend for orchestration? Um, I'm not sure if I would understand your question, uh, what technology options? I mean, because it, if, if you're using your service using a certain set of technologies, you probably would try to implement using the same set of technologies. I mean, you're not going to implement orchestration using a different way. Uh, because you absolutely do not want a mishmash of all the different technologies on the same system, right? So I think you would have to take a bigger picture view rather than just looking at orchestration and saying, how should I best implement orchestration? I would rephrase the question and say, how should I best implement the system? And with that would come as an answer of what would be the best way to do an orchestration. That answers your question? We can offline talk in more details. Um, anything else? Um, any other question? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Okay. So um, events don't change. Events are immutable. Because at a particular time t, you only have only one thing, right? An event has happened, you can't go back in time and change it. So events are always immutable. Now, you could have a different event that might nullify the first event. I wouldn't call it the event change, it's the second event. For example, I placed an order, right? That decided to cancel it. So there's a second event that says, ignore the first one. But they are two separate events. So events have these characteristics that events are immutable. They would never change, right? So you, would, you could have another event or you could have another series of events that might alter the earlier events, sure, but they are separate events. Any other question? Yes. Um, I mean, your event broker is basically there to handle such scenarios, right? Because if, if, the, if the service has picked up that event, right, then that's a different story. But if, if an event happened and services fails to pick up, and let's say it went down and comes back, the broker keeps track of what events have been consumed. So you don't have a problem in that sense. Now, if an event has happened and then your service goes down and the service comes back again, uh, you do run into a problem, and then you need compensating mechanisms of how you handle that. For example, you could have something like timeout, right? I, I expected a certain action, and I expect, I mean, I've passed this to my broker, and at some point of time, I want an acknowledgement. It's a problem with event-driven because, you know, I don't have the synchronous response pattern, right? If I have a synchronous, then that's not a problem. I expect a response back and I didn't happen in a certain amount of time. So then I need some kind of compensating logic, maybe that failed, I need to undo my transaction. Uh, mind you, you also have logs coming, and even, even with the transaction, once the saga has started, I can always query the state of that service, did you get it, did something happen? Right? So if I'm not sure, I can make a query to that. Of course, there's an implementation complexity here that I have to implement all that logic, but there are ways that will solve the problem that you're talking about. Um, any more questions? Yes, sir. Um, so, like I said, events are immutable, you would never remove an event. Now, if you delete a customer data, that's a, that's a separate event, right? So, let's say at time t, you delete a customer data. Obviously, the events that happened before t are valid, and then after t, I try to access that data. When that event happens, the customer service would have updated its database saying this, this line, this record is deleted. So, any event that happens after that, because there's a time factor, right? It's a timeline where these things, any events that happen, you basically can't do anything with that customer data because that customer data doesn't exist. But the events that happened before that were processed, you're fine. So the events that exist in your database, basically, So if you have a... Um, that's an interesting scenario. Um, yeah, I haven't really thought of there are times where you need that. But of course, you could potentially have, like say, how are you storing your events? Um, if you have a broker, you're going to keep a track of it, but generally if you're using an events store, you would have mechanisms of deleting certain events, and this is where kind of event sourcing kind of comes in, is like because I can roll back in time and I can undo the delete. Of course, implementation-wise, there will be challenges, right? And it could potentially get into a little bit of a consistency issue because, you know, if you delete a certain event, let's say you delete a customer information, 
that customer might have placed 1,000 orders. So now you have to go to the product service also, and you can have to do something like, well, this order was placed in some customer, but I don't know who that was. So you have to put in your database um, you know, something like X. This doesn't exist. I don't have that information. So the problem is solvable, right? With event sourcing, I can play back in time and do it. The implementation might not be a simple one. But then again, it's um, if you know that this is a frequent occurrence in your system, right? Because again, in certain in industries, you might have some restrictions like you need to delete it. But let's say if you are operating an e-commerce like Amazon, you can just delete that customer. You don't have to delete the history, right? The history would stay with you. Google doesn't delete your history. Even if you close your account, it still exists. You just can't access it, right? So. Most of the times you have that situation, so you don't have to worry about it. In the rare case where it's absolutely must, there are ways using event sourcing to go back in time and event it. It's just more implementation details, more complexity on your end. Um, questions, if any? Mm, any more questions? Oh, oh yes. Sorry? Yeah, so that's how the CQRS is coming. Remember we talked about the command and query. So that's the situation where you're using CQRS because what CQRS is doing is building a view across multiple databases. Now this is not, again, using, it's an eventual consistency system, right? So if you want to query something, it may not reflect the most up-to-date changes. Yes, you can run into the problem, but it's solvable. And also, you might think, OK, fine, I have like 7,000 services, I have 7,000 databases. You don't really have 7,000 databases or 7,000 services, but let's say you do. Am I going to build a view for all the 7,000 databases? Of course not. Then you've created a big giant database, right? But with CQRS, what you do is you expect the people to do a certain kind of query. So you would build basically a subset of these views that would have just that enough information to query that from different databases. And that might be a subset of your big view. And again, like I said, because you're using eventual consistency, you could run into a situation where your query might, might not be the most up-to-date, but usually that eventual part is very short. So that's often not a problem. Um, any more questions? Um, all right, thank you very much. And you have my contact information. Call me, ping me. Forever.